My name's John Tully, and I'm the author of a book on the 1889 strike at the India Rubber, Gutta Percha and Telegraph Works in Silvertown. In 1889, Samuel Silver's India Rubber, Gutta Percha and Telegraph Works was the biggest, oldest and wealthiest factory on Silvertown's Golden Mile. Since its formation in 1852, it had been strike free. Apart from some craft unionists, its 3,000 strong workforce was completely unorganised. Four big strikes in London's East End in the late 1880s changed all that, and one of these was at Samuel Silver's works. The strikes caught everyone by surprise at the time. Living and working conditions in the East End were appalling. Working class Toryism and apathy were rampant. And even the old revolutionist Frederick Engels despaired that, quote, nowhere in the civilised world are the working people less actively resistant, more passively submitting to fate than in the East End of London. In the summer of 1889, some 16,000 casual dockers struck successfully to demand the famous Dockers Tanner. Inspired by these victories, the 3,000 unorganised workers at Silver's Rubber and Telegraph Works went on strike in September 1889 and they were to stay out until early December. They appealed for help from the new union set up by Will Thorne in Beckton and from the team of socialists who'd led the previous East End strikes. They included Will Thorne and Pete Curran from the Gas Workers Union, Ben Tillett from the Dockers. They were joined by the remarkable Eleanor Marx, the firebrand daughter of Karl Marx, and together with the stoker Fred Ling from the works itself, they formed a formidable organising team and the Silvertown strikers looked set to win their strike. The strikers' demands were modest and included a general wage increase, premium rates for overtime and recognition of the General Labourers' Union as their bargaining agent. Silver's managing director, Matthew Gray, was determined not to give an inch and in fact to starve the strikers back to work. While Silver's was a wealthy company, the company's electrical telegraph products were strategically and commercially important for the British Empire and Silver's was heavily subsidised from the public purse. So Parliament had its eye on this strike. A few other factors weakened the strikers' position. Middle class opinion had swung against strikes. The dockers had also received large donations for their strike fund and their stoppage of it occurred during the warmer summer months. The press too had been neutral or mildly sympathetic to the dockers, but it took a very strong stance against future strikes, including the Silvertown strike. But when it proved difficult to hire local strike breakers, Matthew Gray sent his son, Chris Gray, out into the Essex countryside to recruit non-unionists. These he billeted inside the factory grounds. When he persuaded the police to flood Silvertown with officers, the peaceful nature of the strike changed and Gray's solicitors vigorously prosecuted union pickets. Although the strike had begun during the Indian summer, colder weather set in strike funds dwindled and by December the strikers and their families were enduring terrible hardship. What began as a trickle back to work became a flood. The strike committee called up the strike and its rank and file leaders were blacklisted. Silvertown and its neighbouring districts had played a crucial role in the rise of the new unions and political labour. As the Silver Strike Committee said when they called off their strike, they'd lost the battle, but their struggle had been, quote, an earnest of future demands on the part of underpaid labour. Working people today owe those early pioneers a debt of gratitude, and the Silvertown strike richly deserves to have been pulled from the obscurity into which it had fallen. Mm -hmm.